Up to you. I hope it is. Uh, despite what the slides say, it is actually the 16th class on the 27th of September. So, yeah, I forgot to update that front slide. Don't get confused. I have to admit, first off, that I may have over-exaggerated my Twitter follower count last class. I don't remember what exactly I said it was, but it's 783, so. What? You said that you only had like 100 on there. Oh, well, even better then. Um, and did I say 2,000? Yeah, I thought I said in the order of 1,000. So, okay, I'm not there yet. I'm working on it. And this is some sort of a portrait of me that was done by one of the faculty members in psychology. I don't know. We were at a, we were at a workshop, and the icebreaker was they handed out big paper uh, grocery bags and put a piece of white paper in there, and then you had to stick your hand with a pen in the grocery bag and look at the person and try to, without picking up the tip of the pen, draw their portrait without looking at what you were doing. That's what came out. So I don't know. I thought it was pretty good, so I figured I'd use it as my file picture. <laughs> when we ended last time, we were talking about chromosomes and why these two pictures of chromosomes are basically the same. The structures of the chromosomes look different. So I wanted to be able to return to this. If you have any questions or concerns about how these two pictures are the same, but the chromosomes look different. They're the same number of double helices in both of those two pictures, this karyogram and this metaphase chromosome spread. Different cells, those are not the same pictures, just rearranged in different ways. But those are both human. They're both normal diploid cells. And just for complete transparency, you may have remembered that last time I tried to diagram a double helix and another one that could be crossing it. And that would be something that is representative of the X-shaped things in the picture on the right, which, by the way, is from the first manuscript, 1956. That was the first time that anybody actually got an accurate count of the number of chromosomes in a human. Microscopy had allowed scientists to see chromosomes since about 1900. And this is not a history class. Don't worry about the dates. But it took us almost 60 years between when we could see chromosomes and when microscopy techniques got advanced enough that we could actually see and distinguish all of the chromosomes in humans. The chromosome estimates for the number of chromosomes human ha humans had ranged drastically before that paper. So that's where that, that's the first, basically, the first human chromosome photograph that was taken that was clear enough to see the chromosomes. The one on the left is much more recent than that. And the one on the left, is those, each one of those stick-like things, two chromosomes that are so close to each other, side by side, that they appear to be one narrow strip. So that object is those two things, side by side together. Later in metaphase, this is a review from last class, later, later in metaphase, the arms of the two sister chromatids spread out a bit so they look like X-shaped things, not just like a stick. So in that, there are 46 different objects. They look like individual, maybe sticks. Over here, there are 46 objects that look more like X-shaped things. It just depends on what stage of metaphase the chromosomes are in. So that was last class. Does anybody have any questions, concerns, clarifications they'd like me to try to make? Okay. Well, I'll leave it at that for now. If you think of something, of course. So here on the right side of the right image, what is that X-shaped object? It's the two sister chromatids at metaphase. So I heard you say, oh, that X-shaped thing is a chromosome. I get it. It is. That's normally what we think of when we think of chromosomes. We think of the pair of sister chromatids at metaphase, because that's what we see. And we see it in textbooks, and we see it in the news. And we think, OK, that's a chromosome. I'm OK with you using that term for that X-shaped object. I just wanted to make it clear that technically, for geneticists, that's a pair of sister chromatids 
After those two sister chromatids segregate into the two daughter cells, then we call those two sister chromatids, those two double helices, they finally become chromosomes. It's, it's all terminology. There's no biology behind this. It's all double helices. But in order to be effective communicators of genetics, we have to know the difference between sister chromatids, which is a double helix at metaphase, and chromosomes, which is a double helix of DNA any other time during the cell cycle. Moving forward from DNA replication and chromosome structure into mitosis and meiosis, this was one of the exercises I asked everybody to try out for today. Just diagramming what the chromosomes look like, where they are, in, are in, where they are at in the cell at different stages of the cell cycle. So quick reminder, there's four parts to the cell cycle. The first growth stage, G1, synthesis, which is where all of the chromosomes replicate the second growth phase, G2, and then if the cell is going to divide, it goes into mitosis, the M phase. G1, S, and G2 together are called something that starts with an I, interphase. So it's basically interphase and then cell division. And during interphase is when DNA replication occurs. The thing that I really want to do to assess your understanding of chromosome replication and how it relates to the cell cycle is to ask how many double helices of DNA are there at each point in the cell cycle? And that was one of the purposes of this exercise. Before we go on with that, though, does anybody have any questions about this? Did you try it? Did you get stuck somewhere? Do you have any questions about what I was asking you to do? Any clarifications or questions? Would anybody like me to walk through this? Seeing heads nod silently. That's good. OK. <laughs> so what's here in the cell starting G1? So that's just after cell division. So one of the questions I think I asked was, what do the blue and the red colors represent, do you think, of these chromosomes? This is not meant to be a human cell, by the way. It's meant to be a generic cell. What are the red and the blue? do you think? Chromosomes don't actually look red and blue <laughs> in the nucleus. That's my choice to color them red and blue. One is the original DNA and the other is the copy. So one chromosome, let's zoom in on that. This is the direction that the chromosomes are going to segregate. Cell division is represented by the horizontal dashed line. So this is where the cells are going to divide this is after synthesis, right at metaphase. The cell's about to divide. Cleavage furrow is about to cut right through the middle of the cell. So the chromosomes have to be segregated to the poles. So which direction are these chromosomes going to go? The ones that are on the top of where the cell is going to divide are going to go up or down? Up. Uh, thanks. <laughs> trying to start off easy. It's Friday. And then these four chromosomes are going to go down. So all those chromosomes are going to move that direction, and those chromosomes are going to move that direction. Why to change slides? <laughs> what do you think the thin and the thick lines in each of this? So here's a double helix. That's one double helix. What are the thick and the thin lines probably representing? Original versus new synthesized DNA. Right. So I'm using Messelson installs terminology of the heavy strand being the original strand and the thin backbone being the most recently replicated strand. We've already seen DNA replication. The thick strand served as the template for the synthesis of the thin, in this case, strand. So we used a word last time that rep represents the two different versions of the same chromosome. That's what I colored in red and blue. I was, I was trying to indicate one of them is from one parent, one of them comes from the other parent. So like red would be dad's chromosome, blue would be mom's version of the chromosome that you inherited at fertilization. So let's say that's dad, although I was using P for paternal, M for maternal. So we're going to say blue is maternal, red is paternal. So 
a couple of critical points about terminology. Last time we talked about in a cell, there every cell there are two copies of the same chromosome. So let's say the big chromosome is chromosome one. Chromosome one, and let's say the small chromosomes are chromosome two, just so we can easily refer to different things. So we've got Paternal version of chromosome one, maternal version of chromosome one, paternal version of chromosome two, maternal version of chromosome two. So what are together the two versions of the same chromosome called? They are H something chromosomes. They're, those are the homologous chromosomes the mom and dad versions of chromosome one in this case. So that was what, oh, <laughs> oh no, things are moving. That was what I indicated as the label for that line. Those are homologs. Two versions of the same chromosome, dad version, mom version, chromosome one, the same would be true for the two copies of chromosome two. The piece of information we didn't get to yet, which is another important, really important terminology item, is this vertical blue bracket. What are those two, the two copies of the paternal version of chromosome one, called? Sister These are sister chromatids. And I apologize for my discipline for making you remember all of this. These are sister chromatids. The main thing to know is that there is, each of those sister chromatids is a double helix. That's the most important thing to know. I drew it like a double helix. Each sister chromatid is a double helix. So how many double helices are drawn in that whole cell right now? Does anybody disagree with eight? There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. The four pairs of sister chromatids. This is what phase of the cell cycle? Anytime you can visually see chromosomes compact, metaphase. it's metaphase. Oh, it already says it up here. Look, I'm being redundant. Metaphase. It's the only time you can see compact chromosomes that look like discrete objects. That is the only time, or one of the rare times in the cell cycle, that we refer to a double helix as a sister chromatid. The definition of a sister chromatid is the copy, the pair of copies of one chromosome at metaphase. Any other time during the cell cycle, we call a double helix something else other than a sister chromatid. Call it a, you, you're all thinking it, right? I know you're thinking it, other than what the hell are you talking about? Double helix, do you inherit from somebody we would normally call, it's not chromatid, it's chromosome. This is a weird distinction, but I just want to, give you the opportunity to have it made clear. Each, each of these eight double helices, this is a double helix. It's a chromosome at any other time in the cell cycle. But at metaphase, we refer to the two copies that are stuck next to each other at metaphase as sister chromatids. They're still double helices. We just made, we, my predecessors, that force upon us this vocabulary, invented this term just for metaphase. Two copies of the same chromosome. That is the two genetically identical versions, except for maybe mistakes in DNA synthesis, mistakes that polymerase made, maybe a few SNPs distinguish the two copies of dad's version of chromosome one in that cell at that time, but otherwise they're genetically identical. And they're about to segregate into the two daughter cells because the point of mitosis is to have all the daughter cells, the two resulting cells, have exactly the same DNA in them.
you'll notice a couple slides ahead in this set. I've given you the key to this exercise all with all the DNA filled in. So I'll let you look at that on your own if you want to. I, I will happily go through it in the class if some fraction of you want me to. The only thing I'll point out about that key is just to realize that in terms of how I've drawn this, after the cell division occurs, there are two daughter cells, one up here that I didn't fill in and one here that I filled in what the chromosomes look like. So each, each of those two wiggly blue lines represent the two backbones of the two strands of one double helix. So that's basically one homolog, one of the long homologs unwound. So that's mom's chromosome one, double helix. It's no longer metaphase. The chromosome has unwound. It's less compact, which is why I drew it that way. It's just kind of cotton ball style floating around in the nucleus, the same for dad's version of chromosome one, un, uncompacted, decompressed, dad's red chromosome one, and then the two versions of the shorter chromosomes, chromosome two. So then what I was asking you to do is draw what those look like after synthesis. There would be two double helices of the long blue, two double helices, so there's twice as much DNA from G1 after you do synthesis phase. So that's the next step on this journey through the cell cycle, genetic style, is going to be, what's the amount of DNA, this is the really important point, the amount of DNA at every step in the cell cycle, where does it change, and then how does that get resolved? So we call the DNA content in a cell at a given time C, DNA content. There's another term that we use, which is diploid chromosome number, which is N or haploid is N, diploid is 2N. So over here on the upper left where I've been doing all of the annotation so far, that cell isn't diploid, kind of. How many copies of every, how many copies of chromosome one are in the cell right here? How many, double, how many double helices? Be really clear. How many double helices of chromosome one are in this? Four. One, two, three, four. Okay. Normally in our cells, we have two copies of every chromosome. That cell has four copies of every chromosome. Why is that? What's that cell about to do? I'm about to go through meiosis. So it's about to my, mitosis. It's, it's undergoing mitosis, it's M phase in the cell cycle. So this cell's about to divide. How many chromosomes, how many copies of every chromosome are the daughter cells supposed to have? In a diploid organism, the DNA content of each of those cells should be two. C should be two, and they do. This cell has two copies of chromosome one, the big one, the red version and the blue version, mom and dad, and two copies of chromosome two. So its content, C, is two, two copies of every chromosome. So that means at metaphase, the DNA content of that cell is four, four copies of every chromosome. Right? This is the point of mitosis. You copy all the DNA and then you divide the cells so that the number of chromosomes in every cell remains the same from generation to generation of cell division. So at what point during the cell cycle does the DNA content change from two to four? We're going this way around the cell cycle. Right. So at the end of growth one phase, there are still two copies of every chromosome. And then during S phase, replication occurs, we get to C equals four. So by that point, at the end of synthesis, there are four double helices of every chromosome. And then it goes back down after mitosis. So it's the content of the cell is four copies of every chromosome until mitosis ends, and then we're back to two. So replication, cell division. Start with two copies of every chromosome. Synthesis gives you four copies of every chromosome, and then cell division returns you back to two. So why are we not called tetraploid? We have, depending on when you look in the cell cycle, in other words, you'll see a cell that has two copies of every chromosome, or 2.1, 2.2, 2.3, blah, 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 3.5, four copies of every chromosome. So our cells go through between two and four copies of every chromosome. Why are we called diploid? 
and not tetraploid, which is what we'd be called, we are temporarily tetraploid during mitosis. Because it's temporary. That's not our normal state. That's just whenever we're getting ready to make new cells. So it's just another, it's, it's semantics. It's another genetics definition. Geneticists define ploidy, diploidy, tetraploidy, monoploidy, haploidy, whatever, monoploidy, at G1. That's the definition. Whatever content of the cell is at G1 defines the ploidy of the cell. And the reason I'm making a big fuss about this is because a couple of years ago when I taught this class, a student came up to me afterwards and we got in a really heated argument because I had said that we are temporarily tetraploid here. He was like, we're never tetraploid, we're diploid, humans are diploid. And he was right. I just hadn't appreciated the distinction that yes, even when we're temporarily, when we temporarily have four C, four copies of every chromosome, we're still diploid organisms. That doesn't change through the cell cycle. What does change through the cell cycle is, indeed, the number of double helices of every chromosome. It got kind of heated. I had to like go back to my office and cool down for a little bit. But, but I appreciated it because he was making the point that he thought I was misusing genetics terminology, and I kind of was. I shouldn't have referred to the, and some of the videos that you've watched, if you've watched them, I also refer to that as a tetraploid situation, which I should probably go back and edit. Choose, speaking of what's normal for our cells, this isn't information, first, you don't need to memorize this. I just put it up here for your information. Which phase of the cell cycle really is sort of the standard situation the common state of our cells. And so you can see here, this is from old references. These are studies that were done centuries, or centuries, decades ago. Just looking at how many hours different types of cells spend at the different situations, different states of the cell cycle. So you see that synthesis takes a pretty long time depending on the cell line you're looking at. Mitosis flies right by. But G1, where ploidy is defined, depending on which cell you look in, is indeed one of the longer phases of the cell cycle. So that's where ploidy is defined. I'll give you a second to think of any questions you want to ask or clarifications you'd like me to make before I move on to the rest of a couple exercises I asked you to work on for today. That was one of them. There was one more. Any? Clarifications requested at this point. Everybody's looking down. Fortunately, no one's looking down and smiling, which means I know you're looking at your cell phone and watching YouTube or something like that. I don't know. There's some famous quote about a professor who said, who said, I can tell when you're messing around in class because nobody looks down at their crotch and smiles that much. Or some, I don't know. It's something like that. So here's the key. This is the filled-in version of that exercise. So... You got it to study. If you have any more questions about it, Monday is a great time to ask. So related to that, if you haven't done that this yet, and if you have a device with you and you can edit right now, I would suggest practicing this. Two minutes. Draw a DNA content chart. I did a version of this on one of the videos. So we want the x-axis to be cell cycle stage from G1 to S, G2, and M. And the y-axis is going to be DNA content, how many copies of every chromosome. So the key here is this is for a tetraploid organism. So go ahead and give that a try. If you haven't already, if you have, compare with your neighbor and see if you can convince them that you're right or see if they can convince them that you're wrong. And we'll come back together and see what your thoughts are in a minute or two. Now that two minutes have elapsed, where do we start? So if you, if you have started this at least, how did you start? Where's the logical place to begin dealing with this question? So what's the information I gave you? It's a tetraploid organism. What does that mean? It's got, it's tetraploid. It's got four copies of the chromosome, so four C. 
So where do we put the number four? In which category? G1, S, G2, or M? G1, G1 because that's when ploidy is defined. So if it's a tetraploid organism, it has to have four copies of every chromosome at G1. C is four. Okay. So then what happens at synthesis? It doubles to eight. Every one of those chromosomes gets replicated, so it doubles in chromosome number. Now you've got eight copies of every chromosome in the cell. And then what's it like at G2? Still eight. Nothing has changed. And then it goes back to you get cell division. So each of the two daughter cells then returns to, by the end of mitosis, four. And then the cycle starts again. So I got a, a question up here at front while we were working on this that was basically, how would I ask a question like this on the test? I said, well, it'd be something like this, or like the big colorful figure that we've been working on previously. I might leave a bubble out and say, what does this look like? But instead of for a diploid, what would it look like? It was a triploid organism or a tetraploid organism. So I might change one or two things and ask you to reinterpret what the graph or chart would look like. Maybe. That's an example. That was all mitosis. That's our somatic cells. So here's a little bit more terminology. What are somatic cells? They're all the cells in our body except for sex cells, the gametes. Right, so that's one clear distinction between mitosis and meiosis. Mitosis is for all the cells in our body, in a regular cell division, chromosome number doubles, and then cell division happens, we're back to the same ploidy, two copies of every chromosome. Meiosis is germ cells, or germline. So those are the two important words, germline versus somatic tissue. Somatic tissue is all the cells except for the germ cells, which are the sperm and the eggs, depending on which sex you are. So either sperm or egg. So most, the vast majority of our cells are somatic cells. They do mitosis. And then the cells that are going to produce the gametes do meiosis. Why is, what's the key difference in cell divisions between mitosis and meiosis? Mitosis does the number of cell divisions. Mitosis has how many cell divisions? One. One cell division gives you two, cells. two daughter cells. You go from, in a diploid, you go from 2N to two cells that are each 2N. Two copies of every chromosome in the mother cell, DNA replication happens, and then cell division, and you get back to the same number of chromosomes. What would happen if DNA synthesis didn't happen in mitosis? Actually, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> if there was no synthesis, then who knows? Because we don't have any cells that we can find out what would happen. The chromosomes might break in half as they're dragged into the daughter cells. You might wind up with two cells that have one copy of each chromosome. Or you might, as was just suggested, get one cell that had all the chromosomes and one cell that had zero chromosomes. It would be bad. It would be catastrophic because the cells wouldn't be genetically identical to the parent cell. Mitosis. Start with a diploid cell, wind up with two diploid cells. If you did that with no synthesis, you would have the amount of DNA or otherwise change the balance of DNA between the two daughter cells. And so synthesis is important. Mitosis' job is just to make duplicate cells, identical cells. Meiosis. How many divisions? Start with a diploid cell. Two divisions. You do DNA synthesis. I didn't draw this step in the last slide, so I hope that doesn't become a confusing point. Just like mitosis, it starts with synthesis. Then we do the first cell division, and that gives us 
two daughter cells, each of which are diploid, 2N, except this is meiosis, not G1, so there is it's still a diploid organism, but yes, two copies of every chromosome. And then the second division, each of those cells divides in half again, depending on which sex we're talking about in next class, which means next Friday, we'll talk about the difference between spermatogenesis and oogenesis and meiosis and how this isn't always true. But from two 2N two cells, you get four cells that have one copy of each chromosome, and that might be sperm, for example, if we're talking about male meiosis. Flagellated, ready to go, carrying one copy of every chromosome from dad, trying to make offspring. Why is this important? Why meiosis? Meiosis is restricted just to fertility, fecundity, replication, propagation of the species. Why is meiosis essential? Why do we have some cells in our body that do this crazy two divisions situation? So how would the, what's going to be, let's finish sex right now. And then we'll talk about what happens if meiosis gets screwed up, briefly. So if you have sperm meets egg, how do I draw an egg? It looks kind of like one of these cells. I'm going to do a different color. Here's an egg, oocyte, big nucleus, sperm meets egg. Fertilization happens. What is the DNA content of the egg? Two N. Oh, no, one N. It's N. It's haploid. It's got one copy of every chromosome. Why is that critical? We're diploid. We have to have, we're supposed to have, we're meant to have two copies of every chromosome. So when those two cells get together, you've got a one cell embryo that is 2N. It's a human. Well, if we're talking about humans, it's a human. And then mitosis starts. And one 2N cell divides and becomes two 2N cells, 4, 8, 16, 32, and suddenly you're an adult human, wondering why the hell you're learning genetics. <laughs> So meiosis is important because we have to have two gametes from two different individuals that come together to make a 2N cell. What would happen, as was being alluded to just now, what would happen if meiosis didn't happen? If you had a 2N cell and we did something called meiosis, but there was just one division, that was it. So DNA would replicate. You'd have a 4N cell. That's synthesis. You go through one division. Then what's the ploidy of the gamete that gets produced? You get one division, two cells. Each of them are 2N. So you've got a couple of 2N sperm. And then assuming that the oocyte does the same thing, nucleus, also N, or also 2N, then when those cells meat and fertilize, what do you get? 4N. Four Four N. Twice as many chromosomes as you're supposed to have. But it gets worse. How does it get worse? Now you're a tetraploid organism. You go through growth, you make tetraploid gametes, because there's only one cell division. So then you get a tetraploid egg and a tetraploid sperm meeting and making an octoploid offspring. And then the octoploid offspring makes a hexadecaploid, 16, 16 chromosome content, right? So then it goes 16, 32, 64. Pretty soon, yeah, your nucleus explodes because you've got so many versions of every chromosome that you don't have cells that have enough resources to make all those chromosomes, or they can't all fit together in the, chromos in the nucleus. Or when cell division tries to occur, the chromosomes get all tangled up and cell division doesn't happen properly and you die. So meiosis is critical. You have to have two rounds of cell division to get back to whatever ploidy it is the organism is supposed to be. Be it diploid, tetraploid, octoploid. Strawberries do this. They're dodecaploid. 12 copies of every chromosome normally. So during synthesis, after synthesis, they've got 24 copies of every chromosome. Yeah, dodecaploid, 12. 24 after cell, after synthesis, and then they go back to 12. Oh, man. Meiosis. So quick check-in, finish up with 
a little bit of information about the exam, which I'm glad somebody mentioned was next week because I had forgotten. I know you hadn't, but <laughs> I was glad to get the reminder email. I'm already really starting to study for the, uh, the exam, and I thought, really? That's really good. You're like, you are doing a good job, by the way, of starting to study now, but I thought you were studying way in advance. That's what I get for not checking my calendar. So th thank you for that. You know who you are. So I just wanted to do a quick check-in and talk about the course goals and see where we're at in terms of, am, do you think I'm meeting what I said the course goals were? So we have been talking about facts and terminology of genetics. We're going to see in this exam, potentially, how you might demonstrate your mastery of genetic skills and processes under novel circumstances. That means applying basic knowledge that we've talked about in class in new situations. That's Some of the exam questions will probably be like that. We've done a little bit of quantitative reasoning, uh, analysis tools like Microsoft Excel or Google Sheets to do calculations, to make models, to predict things. Concepts of random processes, we've done a lot of that. What's the probability of finding a nucleotide or a combination of nucleotides on a chromosome sequence? What's the probability of getting any four nucleotides in a row? A quarter times a quarter times a quarter times a quarter. One in every 256 nucleotides. The fact that sometimes there are lots of potentially correct answers, and we haven't really, I, you have been asking questions in class. Ask specific questions of me during class. That I can't really control. I hope you will continue asking me questions during class. And we're still working through mastery of the course. Right now, we're just about to finish up that first topic, molecular genetics. Talked about DNA structure, chromosome structure, DNA replication, chromosome segregation, and mutation, the causes of and evidence for genetic variation. Then we're going to move on to the other three big topics in the class. We've definitely been working on, and thank you for joining me in doing this, the finding and using quality information relative to genetics. A lot of those Canvas discussion questions, can you find a primary research article that supports or refutes a particular fact about DNA? That's been really good. You've been doing a really excellent job at that in general. We haven't done a lot about opposing arguments related to the impact of genetics on society. When we get to genetically modified organisms in particular, I'm hoping that we'll definitely be having some good in-class opinion-based conversations about GMOs. Good, bad, good for the planet, bad for the planet, good for you, bad for you. And then we're still working on statistics. We'll do a little bit more statistics when we start talking about Hardy Weinberg, Mendel, and so forth. And then We'll also do a little bit more of modeling experimental outcomes and coming up with hypotheses to test. That usually is when we get to transmission genetics. So thanks for sitting through that. I just wanted to explain. I thought it was useful to see what we've done so far and where we're going. We are not going to cover, even though we just talked about meiosis last class, mitosis and meiosis last class in this class, I don't feel like you've probably had enough time to digest it, think about it, ask me questions about it, so that's not going to be on the test next Wednesday. So the test will cover those first five topics. No mitosis meiosis. That will show up on the next test. So it is, of course, still valuable to know. Some of you have asked me about practice exams or what the types of exams I give normally look like. And we specifically had a question about what sorts of things do I expect you to be able to do. I figured it would make it easier for you if I just copied and pasted the objectives that I wrote in the different class manual chapters, the PDFs that you've been looking at. These are the sorts of things that are the objectives. Those are the sorts of things I'll write questions about. Not exclusively, but predominantly at least. If you can do these things, those, that list. So let me assuage any fears. Are there any things up here that you don't feel like we've done much of or if you'd like me to explain what I mean by any of those points? I think we've done all those things, in my mind. I don't think I've missed any of those. Structures and components be like telomeres, centromeres, chromosome structure, acrocentric, telocentric. We did one example of the compare a karyogram and karyotype to identify discrepancies. We did one example of that in class. We talked quite a bit about restriction endonucleases and that list. Those are your study topics things to focus on as you're studying. Not, we haven't done all of these things. Uh, locate the DNA sequence of a gene. 
we did an example of that, but I probably won't ask you to do that on this exam because we've only done it once. We haven't practiced it repeatedly. We've done a lot of numbered DNA alignments and consensus sequences, so that's a good thing to study. More prediction, frequency of a given nucleotide sequence we've done. We've talked about types of mutations, identified the outcomes of various treatments, thymine dimers, how they get repaired by DNA polymerase, indels and microsatellites, notation, and not the last one. We haven't quite gotten to personal genomics yet. So don't worry about that point. So say all of the objectives from those topics except for those two. Any questions? Concerns? Inquiries? Yeah. Usually, in terms of letter grade distribution, yeah. average. So average, usually a B, high B. Okay. Just remember that C is fifty percent. Like a middle C is fifty percent of the points on the test. So in other words, the average is higher than C. And. We're still working on one Canvas discussion piece for next classes to do Sunday night, if I remember correctly, if that's what the 29th is, off the top of my head. Or is that? Friday, Saturday, Sunday, yeah. And at the end of class, or maybe already you have it, I just sent out a mock exam PDF to Google Classroom. <coughs> Try it if you want to. This is a good chance to practice annotating a PDF. If you want, you can send it back to me by Google Classroom, attach and turn in. Just if you want to practice that one more time before the exam. At least, please, use that as an opportunity to study. I didn't ask, a, I didn't put a question in on every one of those objectives, but on some of them. So it's a good chance to see what an exam will look like. It's not necessarily exactly the same number of questions or exactly the same content of questions, but it's representative. It'll give you a little bit of a flavor for the types of questions that I might ask. If you get stuck somewhere, the um, study session for the exam is Monday. So you've got the weekend to try to do this, do some studying. Please come to class on Monday with questions. I don't prepare anything for the review session. I will be here as a resource for all of you that show up if you want to show up. Ask me questions. I will try to do my best to answer your questions and clarify things. That's the format of the review session. Just a second. Yeah. Hold on. I can't hear if anyone starts putting... I'm really close, but... Is it not there yet? It pro I probably set it to distribute at 150. So it'll show up a bit soon. Thank you for asking. Okay. We've got five more minutes, so if you want to come up and ask me any other questions, feel free. Otherwise, have a fantastic weekend. Thank you.